Hello, and welcome back to the Wise Athletes Podcast with your hosts, Joe Lavelle and Dr. Glenn Winkle. On today's episode number 96, we are talking with Daniel Tofik, co-founder of HealthSpan. HealthSpan is a telemedicine provider of longevity medicine, to use the generic term for this emerging industry. Daniel has an illuminating personal backstory to starting HealthSpan, and he says they focus on HealthSpan, not longevity, by specializing in pharmaceutical interventions that target cellular senescence. If you are like me, the idea of stepping outside of the regular medical industry can be a scary move, but I am starting to think the upside makes the investment in time to better understand my options is worth it. HealthSpan is one of the emerging providers that makes this process less scary by providing medical expertise to evaluate each client's situation before providing prescriptions and by monitoring the impact of the medications using regular blood tests. They also provide access to experts and their community of clients to provide answers to the questions that any reasonable person would have. According to Daniel, a normal part of the aging process that we are all going through right now is we are accumulating more damaged and dysfunctional cells that are unable to carry out their original functions. Some of these cells, senescent cells, go a step further and recruit healthy cells to become dysfunctional cells. Daniel says the interventions they focus on, which include rapamycin, metformin, and acarbose, target three areas to prevent, resolve, and reduce the impact of these senescent cells. The first is autophagy, which is the body's way of cleaning out damaged cells in order to regenerate newer, healthier ones. The second is going directly after the senescent cells to reduce the inflammation and chemical signaling, which is creating more senescent cells. And the third target is boosting metabolic efficiency by using interventions that increase mitochondria efficiency in healthy cells and which cut off the excess glucose preferred by dysfunctional cells. If you are curious to learn how to go down this longevity medicine path, listen in to learn how HealthSpan can help wise athletes like you and me to feel informed and help us to stay safe. All right, let's talk to Daniel Tofik of HealthSpan. Dan Tofik, welcome to the Wise Athletes Podcast. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be on and it's uh, great to chat with you guys. Fantastic. Welcome to South Korea. <laughs> Very good. Good to have you on board. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Glenn. It's a pleasure. Well, good. Well, let's jump into this thing. I, I, let me start by saying that this whole longevity medicine is kind of new for me. You know, of course, I've been hearing about longevity for a long time and more recently health span as a concept related to the time in life when we're healthy, you know, without chronic disease or disability from aging. The first thing I ever heard of was uh, metformin. Yeah. Maybe it was like eight years ago or something. And then much more recently, the thing was rapamycin. That was the, that's the big thing. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, for a lay person like me, those are prescription drugs. You know, you can't get them. Uh, I mean, unless you're going to buy from a website in India and not know exactly what you're taking and hope you don't grow another head. But yeah, I mean, my doctor was not going to give me some immune suppression drug that was approved by the FDA for organ transplant patients. So I didn't even think, you know, this wasn't something for me to spend my time thinking about. But then very recently, I've discovered that there are a few doctors who are offering longevity medicine. And some of them, like your company, Dan, offer telemedicine. Sure. And so that is how I found you. And so why don't we start with this? You just tell us about why did you start this company, which is uh, called HealthSpan? Yeah. And what is it you guys do? I'll just say that what I understand you to do is to offer off-label uses for pharmaceuticals that are known to extend longevity and health span in animal models. Yeah. Tell us about your company. So my story is 17 years in the making. Oh. After I graduated UCLA, I was studying molecular biology there. And I was working in a lab where we were studying the first molecule that you brought up, metformin, in the context of, of neurodegeneration. So we're talking about Alzheimer's dementia in this case. Okay. We were using metformin to treat these pathologies from the context of metabolic breakdown. So Alzheimer's in the context of your ability to metabolize glucose when you get older diminishes. Hmm. And then downstream of that, when you get this neuronal atrophy, you get this inflammation that causes this, the neuronal death as your immune system attacks it. So we're using metformin in that context. There's another pathway 
called mTOR, which is kind of the, it's the air traffic controller for cellular growth. And if we look at neurodegeneration as a function of inflammation, mTOR dysfunction, the excessive expression of cell growth and the production of these inflammatory molecules could also cause this neurodegeneration. So we're looking both at rapamycin and metformin as molecules to be a prophylactic against the the end state of uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. So I was working on this in 2006. It wasn't, these drugs were used in animal models. It wasn't something that was kind of hit the mainstream. In about 2018, 2019, I start hearing kind of the science influencer types talking about this. Yeah. And I had the same experience as you. I went to go talk to my primary care physician about taking metformin and they scoffed at the idea. My wife okay. is a physician. My brother is a physician. And if I brought up the idea as a, I would have been 35 years old at that point with, you know, work out every day, the idea of taking metformin, the primary care physician just like laughed and said, no, that's, that's not something I would do. Right. And then we talk about rapamycin and all the coverage on rapamycin as kind of a, a way to increase health span. And this is an immunosuppressant drug, right? So yeah. this, let me relate this to kind of my own family health crisis. So my wife had lymphoma. She had a relapse of lymphoma. So she had to get a stem cell transplant. And this is something, someone who is incredibly active. She was the captain of the water polo team at Harvard. She's like a total go-getter type A. Yeah. And so these things just happen to people. But she was put on rapamycin oh. for immune suppression after her stem cell transplant. And I was reading at the time an article by Peter Atia about the prophylactic use of metformin to prevent cancers, playing on some of the metabolic quirks of cancer cells to consume glucose in a way that normal cells don't. So they have like a strategic advantage. And... I tried to get my wife into Peter Atia's practice. It was just like, it was impossible. So the idea was, how could we create a telemedicine practice that takes the best tenets of that level of care, which is novel pharmaceutical interventions, the use of rapamycin, acarbose, uh, is something we're, we're adding shortly is using continuous glucose monitors, elevating our lab testing, and also pairing that with a high level of, analytical HR, human resources, so that we could take the latest from the research community and give our patients practical next steps. Because it goes back to that initial conversation we had about going to your PCP and talking about taking these novel interventions. Their bandwidth with dealing with acute problems is so hot. My brother is a hospitalist. He's dealing with you know, all these acute problems every day. He's not reading research, right? Like in the same way that folks in the science community kind of on the academic side are. Yeah. And so how can we translate that and bring it to the clinical four, if you will, and provide those insights to our patients? And now, as you know, this is something we're getting better at every day. And we're moving to this end state where we can really use data of our patients and do a summarization of everything that's going on on the research side to provide really kind of tangible next steps and break through the noise of what's happening on the in the wellness community. Great. That is great. Something that I am looking for myself. Let's get into a little bit of specifics here. Like what are the benefits of the off-label pharmaceuticals that I'll say known to provide longevity benefit? I mean, how do we know? I mean, I don't think we've been tracking people for 50 years taking this stuff. So what are the benefits and, and how do we know? And, and then for the audience here, can these things be taken late in life and still have a big benefit? Or do you got to start when you're 20 years old, you know, like calorie restriction type interventions? Aging compounds over time. So I'm going to tell the story of cellular senescence. So this is like, HealthSpan is a telemedicine clinic that is dedicated to the mitigation of the harm from cellular senescence. So just briefly as a background, okay. a damaged cell has three fates. It can either kill itself, something called apoptosis. 
it can go to a very dangerous state, tumor genesis, which is uncontrolled growth and replication of that cell damage, which causes this systemic harm. Or it can go into this third phase, which is cellular senescence, which means Mm. the harm that is incurred to that cell doesn't get passed on. It simply stays, it's because a senescent cell cannot replicate, it stays in that dysfunctional state. And this is the body's way of protecting us from that end state of, of a tumor growing or more systemic tissue damage. So the thing about that is we're young, we can clear out senescent cells, right? And as we get older, our body's ability to clear out senescent cells through our immune system is gets diminished, right? So as we get older, we accumulate more and more senescent cells. And senescence compounds because a senescent cell is harmful, it is highly inflammatory, it is a dysfunctional cell that carries this damage that is has a morphology of being very big, right? So it t- consumes more energy than other cells do. And it also is something we call mitogenic. It causes other cells to replicate. So you're getting this compounding of cellular dysfunction hmm. as you get more and more of the senescent cells. It causes adjacent healthy cells to become senescent. So you get older, the more you accumulate, the more tissue damage you're getting. So if you're an athlete, you're you know, you're getting terminal loss of joint health. You're getting your skin is becoming more inflamed, right? So Hmm. these interventions can be applied. It's a math problem, right? So how can we stop the accumulation of senescent cells? It doesn't matter at what point in life you are applying this intervention. We want to slow it down and ultimately lead to the clearance of some of these senescent cells. So the one intervention we're specifically talking about is rapamycin. Rapamycin basically slows down this uh, dysfunctional, unregulated uh, cell growth that we see in senescent cells, all the harmful pathologies that I just talked about. And we do it in a cyclical way because cell growth is good. Cell growth is good in one context. In the Your listeners are highly active people doing resistance training. I work out, do resistance training five days a week, and I want that cell growth for tissue repair and to add muscle, right? Mm -hmm. mTOR is the driver of that cell growth. We don't want to impinge on mTOR all the time. We want cyclical pulses of mTOR inhibition in order to prevent this kind of dysregulated cell growth that's causing these pathologies through cellular senescence. So we take rapamycin once every seven days to get the therapeutic value for 48 hours and then go back into a normal healthy state. And I could talk about to how over time we see in a normal human being, the ability to accumulate muscle gets diminished. We have something called anabolic resistance. Yeah. This is a function of mTOR constantly being elevated. So if your mTOR is constantly being elevated, your ability to respond to new stimuli, whether it's protein intake or resistance training, gets diminished. You're giving the stimulation, but you're not getting that output because mTOR is constantly on. So we want to protect that mTOR activity to go back to normal basal states. And that's why we use rapamycin to fight against things called like sarcopenia and allow us to maintain the ability to add muscle. So these things aren't really at odds. They're kind of supplementary. Oh, that's important. I guess I would have just uh, intuitively thought that um, turning off mTOR would be bad. I would lose muscle. You know, I wouldn't be able to gain muscle. But you're talking that we're not turning it off permanently. I mean, maybe if we took it every day, rapamycin, then that might happen, but we're taking, we're talking about taking it once a week. So it mTOR gets turned down for a short time and then it can go back, but even better than just it going back, it's now better than it was because we had turned it down. And now when it comes back, it's more effective. We're maybe getting past this anabolic resistance. Am I understanding that right? That's absolutely right. So the use case that you brought up first 
was taking it every day. This is the use case that my wife was in when she was taking it for immune suppression so that she wasn't having this graft versus host issue she was having. Her stem cells were attacking her tissue. The difference between the, the health span promoting longevity usage of it, the, the way that we optimize health for the longest period of time, is we take it cyclically so you don't get this immune suppression. We have almost a thousand patients on rapamycin. and we haven't had one patient have some uh, systemic immune attack infection among any of our patients because of that cyclical dosing. It prevents that systemic immune suppression that could cause harm. All right. Well, that is really helpful. Uh, um, now, so what are the benefits? I, I mean, we've, we've talked about health span in terms of extending the time that we're healthy and, and maybe lifespan. And I've heard that in animal models, so, you know, worms and flies and mice and, and maybe in dogs, there's been scientific study that it does actually extend lifespan. And I think that there's also been some study in terms of like reversing of functional declines related to aging in these animal models, immune system boosting and, and things like that. But um, in terms of people, we have reason to believe that if it's happening in these animals, it would happen in people too. But I think there's also been some work done with people, maybe not on life extension, but on improving the immune system and things like that. Can you tell us about the benefits? And, and let's focus on uh, rapamycin. Yeah, I mean, I think you use the, the correct word is it prevents functional decline, right? So. I take it as a 38-year-old to as a prophylactic against getting age-related chronic diseases. Mm. And the question is an important one, but it is so expansive. Because if you look at this unmitigated mTOR-driven aging, it extends to nearly every age-related chronic disease. So there's a guy named Mikhail Blagasquani. He came up with this theory of hyperfunctionality. It's basically these cells are hyperfunctional. Their morphology is really big. They emit too many inflammatory molecules. They emit too many of the, the proteins that they're supposed to make, and they're sort of toxic to the systemic environment they're in. And then they cause hyperplasia, which is the cell growth of, of adjacent cells. So if you look at nearly any pathology, any age-related disease, whether it's, you know, wrinkles, let's take that, for example, that is the overproduction of keratin by keratinocytes as we get older. Hmm. In the case of Alzheimer's and dementia, it is the overproduction of tau proteins as we get older, as mTOR becomes dysregulated. If you look at nearly any age-related chronic disease, it is a function of hyperactivity of the cells rather than terminal loss of function. So rather than the, the cells, the tissue shut down, that, could, that should happen, but it is a function of the overactivity of these cells. So if you look at immune function, you look at male pattern baldness, if you look at nearly any age-related uh, pathology, it is gonna be a function of these hyperfunctions of cells. So th with the functional decline as we get older, we, we're looking at kind of a systemic way to, to increase the, the, our tissue, overall tissue health through the entire body. And that's the reason why folks are taking rapamycin to fight functional decline as they get older. And it's pervasive in multiple organ systems, I guess, because it is it is dealing with something that's really fundamental, like at the cellular level. So that's causing an excess of inflammation, which is then sort of generally blocking things or, or causing trouble in lots of different places. And so if we can knock the inflammation down, then that relieves some of the interruption of what would normally be good functioning of the body at a cellular level. And then that kind of rolls up into now the organs are functioning better and you're getting better repair and all of that. That's it. That's actually, that's absolutely correct. Every cell has this complex called mTOR. So we talked about cellular senescence, these dysfunctional cells that are damaged and they cause adjacent cells to be damaged. And one of the, the traits of these damaged cells is 
their mTOR activity is heightened. It's overactive, right? So they're producing, they're becoming toxic, they're becoming inflammatory, they're bigger. All of those, those traits, those characteristics are causing tissue, the tissue composition to, you're getting a greater percentage of cells within those tissues to be senescent, to be damaged. And then you lose the, the functionality. You first have this hyperfunction, then you get the diminishment of function. So if you're talking about a runner wanting to maintain joint health, you're seeing the accumulation of senescent cells in that joint. So you're getting arthritis at that point. You're getting, if you're talking about osteoporosis, you get the overactivity of a class of cells that break down bone, osteocytes. They resorb bone. In all of these cases, we can go, you name the pathology, the the age-related decline, we can give a um, explanation of hyperfunction and mTOR-driven aging as being a cause of that uh, end state. Okay, I think I'm getting this. And so mTOR is something that is not just a human being thing. Flies and nematode worms and mice, they have mTOR too. And so when we give them rapamycin, the effect on them is the same as the effect on a person, we believe. And if a worm is going to live for 10 days, you can very quickly see that you get an extension on that. And you can do it again and again and again. Uh, whereas if you were going to try to see if a, a human got an extension, you're going to, it's going to take you a long time to get to the bottom of that. Yeah. Okay. So that's why we, that's why we have confidence that it would work. Plus, I think that there have been some studies on humans yeah. to confirm certain functional that's right. reversals of functional declines, like the immune system in elderly people got better, things like that. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So in nearly every animal model you see that they're testing for some pathology, whether it's like the skin collagen reduction or more serious things like neurodegenerative disorders that I spoke about, there's a, a, almost like a billion data points at this point to say that rapamycin uh, turns back those, those systemic pathology, that tissue dysfunction. So Okay. Now, folks are taking that to the human level. So we have uh, Matt Caberlin study at the University of Washington. We have the Pearl study at UCLA that's giving patients uh, rapamycin to, to see how it's affecting these end states. We have over a thousand patients taking rapamycin yeah. and we're getting blood samples from them, right? To make sure that their biomarkers are getting better, that there's no harm to them. So we're collecting more and more data to prove that the, from the, the risk side of things, rapamycin has an incredible uh, safety profile from the data that we're seeing. We don't see people having infections that are causing the stop, the stop of usage of, of rapamycin. Um, we do see patients getting canker sores. That is something that happens transiently you get it for one week it goes away i recently restarted uh rapamycin and got some uh, i took a break from it for about six weeks and then uh got some canker sores the first time in three years that i had canker sore so Uh largely speaking the safety profile is something that people should feel comfortable with there's another aspect of you talked about immune function so someone named, uh, a researcher named Joan Manick gave rapamycin to patients uh, during COVID to see if it increased immune function. There were less respiratory infections, including COVID, with patients taking rapamycin and an overall increase in immune function. And that's largely because of what we talked about before. The composition of the immune system is in a much healthier state after taking the rapamycin. So that tissue function that we talked about, the composition of it becomes more intact, more healthy, kind of, if you think about it, it's kind of a more pristine state. That's helpful. It's interesting. It's so counterintuitive I, for me as a layperson. this business of excessive growth then results in systems breaking down. So maybe it's like a, when I was a younger person, I remember that, aging was sort of like a wear and tear thing, right? 
It's like yeah. your car would wear out eventually. And, it, you know, and a car can only last so long. But of course, with a car, if you maintain it and you replace the parts as they wear out, well, then a car can last for a long time. Uh, I mean, those a million mile Mercedes Benz, is, there was very little sure. <laughs> at the million mile mark that was the same as, as when you bought the thing new. And maybe the body is kind of like that as well. You know, we're all uh, subject to entropy. And, and so you have to put energy into a system to keep it ordered. And so, you know, some of the food that we eat goes to our systems for repairing and maintaining our systems so that they continue to work the way they're supposed to. But if this uh, excessive growth thing, which I'm not sure exactly I understand why that happens, and we can come back to that. If that causes the, the repair mechanisms to not function the way they're supposed to, then you're going to accumulate errors over time. And if those errors start to compound, you'll get this sort of exponentially bad accumulation of problems. And so let's go back to this. Why is that happening? Is, is it a, a function of people, instead of having times of feast and times of famine, they just have feast all the time. And so we have excess calorie consumption and maybe that's turning things on too much. Or is it really just the body did not evolve to live forever. It evolved to get to a point where you could reproduce and then it didn't really matter that much anymore. And so we didn't get evolution pressures to perfect this maintenance of our systems forever. So they just start to break down and eventually it, it, uh, it goes bad. I mean, is it one or the other or both? Aging is an amalgamation of many things. And we're focused on this mTOR driven aging pathway, right? Mm. But you really hit on something at the beginning of kind of the lifestyle, the things that are in people's control, right? So this thing mTOR, which is this, this switch that says grow, and uh, or let's self-consume in a process called autophagy. It is taking signals from your a nutrient state. So when do you want to grow? When you have energy to do it, right? So you consume a lot of amino acids, you consume a bunch of carbohydrates. The cell now says, hey, it's a great time to grow. We have the proper proper energy source, the source that will be broken down into ATP, the currency of, of work within the cell, hmm. let's grow, let's grow. Conversely, now you have all the folks that are doing either caloric restriction or are doing intermittent fasting, taking 24 hours to fast. What those folks are doing is they're saying, let's deprive the cell of a nutrient source so that it's not growing but con in addition to that, it's also self-consuming. We talked about all those toxic molecules that are coming out of these dysfunctional cells. Mm -hmm. Let's use that cellular debris as energy, like a spring cleaning for the cell to one, stop this accumulation of these toxic senescent cells, but also make it so your the tissue is less inflamed, your overall tissue composition is much healthier. So if you think about it between those two paradigms, you're either providing the fuel for growth or you're restricting the nutrients to say, let's get into a cellular cleanup stage. What do you think on a standard American diet where you're consuming energy and it's usually caloric excess consistently, that's going to fuel growth all the time? Mm -hmm. all the time. And so one way to, and, and so you're getting all the stimulation for growth, right? And, and we talked about growth being good in the context of repairing tissue. These signals for growth, we see populations that have very bad negative uh, health outcomes. So obese people, they have this growth switch on all the time. So they're growing a lot of bad tissue. Bodybuilders, right? They're taking androgens are taking steroids to send signals to grow you know i can't think of a bodybuilder in their 60s who hasn't had some kind of heart intervention whether it's arnold schwarzenegger getting heart surgery or you know all, all of these hmm. negative effects of persistent growth daily you're growing bad tissue now 
if you're exercising, that growth is going to good play. You're repairing tissue, you're adding more muscle mass. And so you're kind of focusing that mTOR, that, that muscle, the, the growth into the right places in the body. So one reason why we're getting this decline is we're just kind of fueling our bodies inefficiently. We're excessively fueling our bodies. The second piece of it is just this, not this evolutionary protection mechanism called senescence is just accumulating with time. Our body does not have the ability to clear out these senescent cells at the same rate that we're accumulating them. Hmm. And so this is the compounding of aging. This is the compounding of tissue dysfunction. So you can see how these are, there's multiple levers here. There's the diet and exercise stuff. You want to make sure that your metabolic health is such that uh, you're not fueling unmitigated growth. And then from this natural standpoint of accumulation of senescent cells, we don't want to feed that more by giving more fuel for the fire. And there's approaches like fasting or the pharmacological use of rapamycin, even metformin, that can slow down that rate of a senes- senescent growth. Okay, that's great. So everybody listening in here is familiar with the idea of improving lifestyle in order to slow down aging, I guess, which is maybe not quite the right way to say it. Maybe it's to stop the acceleration of aging, you know, so don't smoke, which is a aging accelerator. Be sure to get some exercise, get good sleep, eat healthy food. Don't get too heavy or too thin, manage your stress, have good family, good, you know, social life, that kind of a thing. And I think that to a large extent, the people who are listening to this podcast, you know, they've been following Glenn and I along here and we talk about these things pretty often. This is new. And so the question is, are these pharmaceutical interventions, how big of an effect should people be thinking that this is? I mean, is this, you should definitely do the lifestyle things or is this a pill and give up on the rest of it? It's not worth it anymore. Uh, What would you have to say about all of that? There's no rapamycin dose that is going to cure a bad diet. There's no rapamycin dose that's going to cure the lack of exercise, right? So you need to start there, right? Because the those two things are playing on the same pathways that rapamycin is, is playing on, right? Mm. In terms of benefit, I'm 38 years old. I've been taking it for about 28 months at this point. Mm-hmm. People ask, how do you feel? Do you feel great? Like, do you have more energy? And I said, no, I don't. I take it for that prophylactic case. Okay. There are folks with pathologies that are with, you know, chronic issues, particular to inflammation that have remarkable effects. So we have like uh, a gentleman who wanted to continue to run and just had, uh, he was running, you know, uh, like, marathons at the age of 65 and he just had incredible inflammation in his joints he had arthritis and that individual had a a remarkable effect there's people with brain fog that have really positive effects people with issues of inflammation are going to see uh improvement in how they feel but largely you're taking this to extend the functional capacity of those tissues so that when you're at those ages uh, where your friends are getting chronic age-related chronic diseases you're spared from that because your 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 tissue composition is healthier i would say you're not going to feel like a million bucks it's not we don't like want to be snake oil salesmen and be like you're going to feel like uh, 22 again that's not going to happen The idea is we're going to increase your health span, the amount of time that you are to help these days. Gotcha. All right. Well, do you have any kind of ballpark uh, kinds of thoughts about what kind of a life extension on average people can be looking for? You know, I think I've heard that it like doubled the life of worms and it gave a 40% improvement in the life of mice or something like that. I mean, maybe a person is... 10%? 10%? I mean, what do you think? Well, I don't think we have any real idea. There's a couple, there's a, 
uh, the National Institute for Aging did this intervention testing program. It was in mice and the mice had a 26%, I believe it was 26% extension of lifespan. Now, it's hard to extrapolate onto humans because mm -hmm. in an animal model, you can control for so much. You're, mm -hmm. There's no confounding factors, other things that are happening on the lifestyle front. You're giving them rapamycin and acarbose and you're, you can monitor every other variable in their life. It's just hard to do for humans and it's a very long-term study. But life extension isn't why we started it really. Hmm. We really, it was about health span. It was about our own family health crisis. It was hmm. about providing a higher level of care. We just want people to not have the same issues my wife had. We want folks to grow old in a way that they have a healthier tissue composition of healthier cells that is then going to diminish the likelihood that they're going to have an age-related chronic disease. Oh, yeah. Well, I think that, the, again, the audience here, me personally, you know, Glenn can speak for himself, is that, you know, I've got inflammation in my body. My joints hurt you know, more than they used to. I, I mean, even though I, I feel like I'm perfectly healthy, I'm not what I was. And part of that is I hurt more than I used to. And so turning down inflammation sounds really interesting. You know, a, a, a thought that um, occurs to me is, um, why can't we just take antioxidants to get kind of an anti-inflammatory benefit in our bodies? The study of antioxidants has been, we've poured, you know, billions of dollars into the use of antioxidants. And it was basically, the idea is you're getting the accumulation of DNA damage uh, as you get in this more oxidative state. Now, consuming more antioxidants is a good thing. It's going to reduce inflammation. It's going to increase mitochondrial capacity. It doesn't seem to have the data on it over you know decades and decades. It doesn't have the effect of really slowing the progression of aging because largely our body has a has these built-in programs to deal with cellular damage, right? So if we see these dysfunctional cells, our immune system has a way of clearing them out. So we really want to bolster that process as opposed to slowing down the progression of damage itself. That we have, we have so much damage that occurs billions of cells are put to death every day and uh -huh. we really want those processes to be bolstered. Right. So that's what I would say. Okay. Well, that's great, Dan. I've gotten to the end of my questions. So here's where I'll turn it over to you and, you know, anything that I wasn't smart enough to ask you about, you can talk about here and then tell our audience how they can find more information about this and, and find your company online. Sure. I mean, the last thing I would say is I would compel people to just understand the science of these pathways of metabolic. How do we break down nutrients into energy? Because we want to use all of these states that we talked about, whether it's nutrient deprivation or nutrient pulsing amino acids at a given time to bolster certain certain phases of life right so we want to grow muscle we but we also want to clear out dysfunctional toxic cells so how do you use those those pathways to your advantage mm -hmm. is there an approach where you segment your week to optimize for those things could you do a fast intervene in some of these these metabolic processes to take advantage of cellular cleaning, but then also use nutrients and exercise to bolster all the other longevity pathways that are going to serve you as you get older. So really just understanding those levers and they're really simple. We write about them extensively hmm. on our health span review. We don't talk about the medications that we prescribe as much as we're really just talking about 
longevity pathways. So you can go to gethealthspan.com, click on our Healthspan research review. We send out a newsletter every week. And these are just strategies to take advantage of these longevity pathways. That's great. And I also have I follow you guys on uh, Twitter and you guys put stuff there as well. So it's pretty easy to follow along with the information you guys put out. We're really trying to take what's happening in the research community, make it easy to understand. I don't know how well we actually achieve this quite yet, but we're working on it to make it really easy to understand and then apply in your day-to-day life. Right? So outside of taking rapamycin, how do you use diet and exercise to your advantage to slow down these, these longevity or optimize these longevity pathways? Yeah. And I, I guess uh, uh, I'll give you a little feedback and just say that I think you guys do a really good job. I've been reading all that stuff. Now, it, as somebody who's reading something like that for their first time, maybe they wouldn't really fully understand it. So it, it takes a little bit of investment to get introduced to this kind of information. But I think you're aimed at the lay person and do a good job at that. So thanks very much. Appreciate it. And so the website is gethealthspan.com. That's right. Yeah, go to gethealthspan.com. We have also a community forum. You'll see a link to that where you could ask questions to our clinical team. And we try to respond as quickly as possible on that forum. Fantastic. Okay, sir. Well, this has been really useful for me, hopefully for the audience. Thank you very much for your time. Joe, this has been great. Thank you so much. All righty. You guys have a great day. All right. Sweet. Thank you so much for listening in to our discussion with Daniel Tofik of HealthSpan about the emerging longevity medicine industry. You can find more information about Daniel and HealthSpan in the show notes.